It's an honor and a privilege to be here today to talk about Deadwoods Chinatown. Uh, first off, I do want to say uh, it is uh, exciting that we are able to sponsor this uh, year after year and will continue to do so. This year, I think we have about 10 people from Deadwood uh, with our Historic Preservation Commission and Planning and Zoning Commission. And just for, if you would all wave your hands, um, I just want to show the support that we have for historic preservation in Deadwood. We take our, our commitment to the state when we legalize gaming seriously and uh, we'll continue to do so um, with that. We are a National Historic Landmark, uh, one of three architectural uh, sites in, in South Dakota that are architectural landmarks. But we're here today to talk about Chinatown, and every uh, um, we've been working on preserving, protecting, and promoting the heritage and history of the Chinese uh, role and their culture in Deadwood. And in fact, coming up May 13th, uh, how many of you have seen the HBO series Deadwood? Uh, you recognize the, the ch Chinese uh, person here, Keon Young, is coming back to Deadwood again. And we have given him the key to the city. On May 13th is Keon Young Day. Uh, and he'll be at Mr. Wu's on Main Street. So uh, not only can you meet uh, Keon Young at Mr. Y Wu's, you can also start uh, support historic pre preservation by either playing cards or pulling the one, one arm <laughs> bandit. <laughs> so um, what, what we decided to do is, is Robin and I are going to co-present. Uh, Robin's going to set the stage uh, of uh, Chinese in America and their immigration into the United States and then on into Deadwood. And then in, later in the presentation, I'll be talking about our preservation efforts over the last 30 some years uh, to continue to uh, preserve and uh, promote that rich and unique heritage of not only Deadwood, but the, the role that the Chinese played. So with that, I'm going to have Robin come up and start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. It really is an honor to be here today. In the middle of the 19th century, America was receiving a huge wave of immigrants from many countries. For example, more than one million Irish were escaping the Great Potato Famine, which killed hundreds of thousands from starvation or hunger-related diseases. Emigrants from China came in waves. Around the 1849 era, those who crossed the ocean believed they could make their fortune on gum shan translated meaning Gold Mountain, also known as the California Gold Rush. Passage from China to America was spawned by their country's conflicts, miserable living conditions, and of course, news of the California Gold Rush. How many thought, if I only could get there and have my dreams come true? The cost of oceanic transport could range between two and $300. This amount was compounded by a commutation tax requiring captains of all vessels to post a $500 bond for each foreign passenger abroad, aboard. Excuse me. The cost, of course, was passed on to the Chinese laborers, and the collected revenue, according to Iris Chang, went to the largest California hospitals. And even though the Chinese paid well over half of all commutation taxes, they were never allowed to use a city hospital in San Francisco. As was the case with many immigrants traveling by ship, up to 20% died on the journey across the sea. Many of the now new Gold Mountain families donated generous sums of money to build new schools, colleges, libraries, and other public works and philanthropy will be mentioned again shortly. As the gold rush on the, gold on the West Coast diminished, some travelers found work as farmers in California as swamps were drained and turned into farmland, while others continued further east in search of other discoveries. 
Many ended up laying track for the Transcontinental Railroad, as they not only had to provide for themselves, but they had to send money home to their families. Some traveled to Alaska working in the canneries under hor horrible working conditions. It was written that contractors drove workers as if with a whip. Some landowners valued Chinese workers less than that of their animals. I found an outstanding example, which I will share with you. There was a group of Chinese workers on a sugar plantation in Louisiana. After the Civil War, plantation owners toyed with the possibility of replacing black slavery with Chinese labor. Their plan backfired when the Chinese used translators to negotiate their work contracts and sued employers who violated them. Apparently, Chinese workers in the South had what could be called three advantages. Number one, they worked under labor contracts and had interpreters who served as translators and surrogate lawyers. Number two, the Chinese could sue or press charges against their employers. And number three, Chinese workers were protected by a post-war federal government which made it difficult for southern plantation owners to hold Chinese workers in bondage. This is an amazing excerpt I found in Ms. Chang's book, and I had that on display on the table. The sleepy village exploded into a boom town, a roaring frontier town boastful and ambitious, shameless in its filth and greed. It made no effort to hide its excesses or sins. Rowdy young men roamed the streets, determined to spend their gold as fast as they made it. The first two story buildings were hotels and casinos, and the city later enjoyed 46 gambling halls, 144 taverns, and 537 places which sold liquor. As with many gold rush towns, those who profited most handsomely were not just the miners, but those who supplied them with essential goods and services. Fortunes were made in small businesses. For example, eggs cost a dollar a piece, mm -hmm. a pound of butter, six dollars, and a pair of boots was one hundred dollars. And anticipating the needs of miners needing rugged wear, Levi Strauss mm -hmm. made pants out of dedham tent canvas and created an empire. Those who were in the service industry did well, also such as those who laundered clothes. Brothels inevitably flourished with 92% of the population being male. Entrepreneurs in the world's oldest profession rode furiously on horseback to try to fit in as many customers as possible, some women charging more than $100 a night. Sounds like Deadwood, but it was actually 1853 San Francisco. <laughs> a group of businessmen from China fell into the lucrative position of shipping young women and girls over to service the bachelor Chinese men who were already here. In China, during times of famine, a youngest daughter would be sold to fend off a family's starvation. Some women were told one thing to get them on the ship, but when they landed, were thrown into Gold Mountain prostitution. Sounds like the falsehoods of Al Swearingen, <laughs> what he did to get women to Deadwood. And speaking of Deadwood, in 1876, Deadwood, Chinese immigrants created their own camp known as Chinatown. It was located in between what was known as Elizabethtown and Deadwood, as with the other smaller mining towns, including Fountain City, Ingleside, and Pluma, just to name a few. Chinatown was incorporated into the city of Deadwood in 1881 and was the hub of the region's Chinese culture. However, it was never exclusively an Asian community as the Chinese settlers originally wanted. And even Calamity Jane was noted as having lived in Deadwood's Chinatown. 
Due to the draw to this area of Lower Main Street becoming known to those of loose morals and body entertainment, it became known as the Badlands. 70% of the Chinese in the area held service-oriented jobs. In China, women did most of the domestic work including washing clothes. But with the attraction of self-employment and decent profits, Chinese immigrants, who were mostly men, preferred economic mobility over social status. For instance, a 20 foot by 20 foot wash house could be set up for between 10 and $20. Multiple shirts at 25 cents each provided a great way to make a living. And almost from the get-go, Dakota's judicial system and law enforcement officers assured the Chinese of equal protection, most especially from physical harm and property damage. Chinese immigrants moved primarily towards economic advancement. And what better way than to be in the service industry, laundry houses and restaurants? There were no restrictions for the Chinese to own property in Deadwood versus other areas of the growing country. Feely Wong traveled from California with a group of prospectors to Deadwood in 1876. At that time, it is alleged he was a cook. Arriving in Deadwood, they staked out many mining claims and apparently split all the profits, using his to eventually open up his store. One of the most influential Chinese shop owners in Deadwood would be Feely Wong, who, is, who owned the Wing Shui Emporium. Wing is most, closest, most closely translated like glory, and Shui means getting together, thus getting together in glory. His shop at 566 Main Street stocked particulars such as Chinese foods and herbs, novelties, silks, teas, and other imported gifts. His staunch competitor, High Key, owned the High Key Company. An interesting side note to the company names. Typical American businesses name their business after themselves. But for those individuals who follow the teachings of Confucius, it was considered taboo to name your own business after yourself. This emanates from Confucian modesty, but Haiki did. <laughs> Feely Wong spent 43 of his 75-year-old life as a businessman and philanthropist in Deadwood. He was a member of the Society of Black Hills Pioneers. He purchased building materials for the Chinese Masonic Lodge, paid for burials of Chinese in Mount Moriah, and helped with bail money when needed. In 1902, he took his entire family back to China to allow his children to gain a better understanding of the Chinese language and culture. He had all the proper paperwork to leave and return. Due to the extension of the Chinese Exclusion Act formed in 1882, but after he tried returning in 1903, he was detained in Port Townsend, Washington. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was meant to curb the influx of Chinese immigrants to the United States, and in particular to California. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 suspended Chinese immigration for 10 years and declared Chinese immigration, immigrants ineligible for naturalization. And this was signed into law by President Chester A. Arthur on May 6, 1882. The Geary Act of 1892, 10 years later, was proposed by California Congressman Thomas J. Geary. The Geary Act went into effect May 5, 1892, and it reinforced and extended the Chinese Exclusion Act's ban on Chinese immigration for an additional 10 years. It also required Chinese residents in the United States to carry special documentation, which they would have gotten from the Internal Revenue Service. And those were certificates 
documentation of certificates of residency. Immigrants who were caught not carrying the certificates were sentenced to hard labor and deportation, and bail was only an option if the accused were vouched for by a credible white witness. While Feely Wong was detained, he needed to basically prove that he was indeed a businessman and not a common laborer. Citizens of Deadwood, including but not limited to Saul Starr, Harris Franklin, and George Ayers, wrote letters testifying in part that Feely Wong was a merchant and an honorable person to whom full faith and credit should be given. He was released and returned to Deadwood in early 1904. In 1919, he suffered a stroke. Regaining the use of his limbs, but not his strength, he returned to China, reuniting with his wife and remaining family. He passed away in his village of Canton, China, in 1921. And now Kevin will present our historic preservation efforts of Chinatown, including the Chinese impacts as they relate to the rich and unique history of Deadwood. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, we have done uh, within the last uh, uh, 10 years is Feely Wong is now uh, uh, recognized on our wall of fame. Each year, we recognize two individuals who uh, have made a significant impact uh, to Deadwood's history, and uh, we have uh, recognized him on the Wall of Fame, and that's available uh, on, to view on our website or in the hallway at the City of Deadwood City Hall. So obviously, uh, what I'll be talking about is the Chinese immigration and immigrants into Deadwood uh, and what we've able to uh, do from a historic preservation point. Uh, I, one of the things we're fortunate, there were several photographers that were in the Black Hills and in Deadwood very early on. Here we have a couple images of Deadwood in 1877. Uh, the picture on your left uh, is the part of uh, Chinatown. And uh, one of the things I just brought this uh, arrow into is uh, some of the water features. And I'll come back and talk a little bit about that, but wanted to point it out in this phot photograph. I didn't all tangled up. Uh, and then uh, the other one is looking up Main Street from Chinatown. And here you can see Hong Ki uh, washing and ironing business on Lower Main. Uh, we also have eight sets of Sanborn insurance maps from uh, 1885 to 1948. Uh, those are, are great insight in Deadwood's history and used by our office uh, and researchers on a regular basis to see what was located in certain areas of Deadwood. As you look at that, uh, this uh, July 1903 Sanborn map shows Chinatown. Uh, and we have that out on a display booth uh, right around the corner here. And then in 1885, uh, and it's hard to see on this image, but there are stars for chi Chinese-related businesses, laundries, restaurants throughout Deadwood. And so this shows eight additional Chinese businesses that we have been able to identify from those maps that are outside of Chinatown proper. Uh, and so uh, when we talk about the Chinatown, uh, and, and Robin mentions it, not only were they concentrated in that area, but they were spread throughout the community. You can look at the population of Chinese in Lawrence County, and in 1880 census there were 221. I'm going to look this way so I don't have to look around. Um, Chinese in Lawrence County. In 1890, 152, and then 18, 1900, 120, going all the way down to 1940 when there was two Chinese um, showing up in the census. And so part of that obviously relates uh, to the Chinese Exclusion Acts of 1882 and 1892, uh, but then also 
um, just uh, the, what was happening in mining and, and the dirty the 30s and everything else. Here we have a um, Wan Tai uh, owner of the Lincoln Restaurant, which was located on Sherman Street, or excuse me, Lower Main Street. And there are four uh, Chinese individuals that were part of that business. You had Wang Tai, which uh, we have that picture from 1896, newspaper article from September 23rd, 1896. You got Wang Yu, Wang Nong, and Hip Wu are all part of that business operation. And we had Hong Ki, which uh, this photograph is circa 1889. His business is 109 Sherman Street, basically right across from City Hall, where we have the um, Aquatic Center and Rec Center now. Um, we heard a lot about Fi Li Wang, and of course the Wing Shui building. Um, one of the things that uh, we did lose uh, in our, our history, and I'll come back to that a little bit. We also have photographs of the Chinese uh, fire team, hose team. And what's kind of interesting about this, uh, these are Grable photographs, uh, is the uh, race is going down Main Street. Uh, for those who um, know Deadwood, uh, the hardware store in this picture on the right side is where the celebrity is. So they're actually racing down towards Chinatown in this. And that was an effort of Soul Star and his, uh, to bring uh, additional fire protection into uh, Lower Main and in Chinatown. Um, when we talk about uh, preservation, we have to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, obviously, um, we did lose the Wing Shui building uh, in 2005. It happened December 23rd. Uh, there was a building permit that was issued for selective demolition. And for all you preservationists, probably shouldn't use a backhoe when you do selective demolition. Uh, that building was lost, but we uh, have declared it an archaeological site. And uh, should there be anything put in its place, there'll be extensive archaeology required. We require archaeology for any new construction within the city limits of Deadwood. And uh, so we have been able to preserve what's underground uh, that we don't know about. Now, um, we also uh, do a century award for buildings that have hit 100 years of age or older. So the Wing Shui building was recognized and still hangs on our wall in our century room. From 2001 to 2004, we did a four season archeological investigation, uh, well over a million dollars but we found over 350,000 artifacts uh, in those four seasons. And those are uh, preserved and, and cataloged and curated uh, by Mike Rungi, who's in the back here, uh, our archivist uh, in our archeological laboratory. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then most recently, uh, the Four Points Hotel, which was addition to 10 Lizzie's, which for some of you who haven't been there in a while, was Four Points. Um, this was a, a two-season archaeological investigation uh, where we, we found over 50,000 artifacts and we're going through that and cataloging it as well. Uh, we were actually able to do a trench through here and we were able to go down um, about five feet, um, but we also uh, were able to get below the 1883 flood level and see Deadwood from basically 1876 to 1883. Uh, and also um, uh, found one of those water flumes features where we took a 10-foot chunk out, sent it off to North Carolina to be uh, conserved and preserved, and now it'll be on display, hopefully uh, either yet this year or next year down at the Days of 76 Museum. Uh, this is our, our archaeological laboratory and interpretive area. Uh, we uh, do have compactor storage down there, which uh, the Historical Society is going to truly appreciate when you get done your, with your remodels as well. We're able to uh, hold uh, a great deal of, of artifacts within our archaeological laboratory. The other thing that we have created is experiential tourism, where you can buy a ticket and do a walking tour of Chinatown and our archaeological sites, and then come to City Hall 
and get a behind the scenes tour of our archeological and archival uh, collections and meet our curator um, as well. Uh, we took a hiatus during the pandemic, but we're hoping to bring that back here uh, this is next summer. We also are fortunate, uh, next to the Wing Shui, a couple of buildings down, uh, had the High Key building. Most people wouldn't have recognized it as an early Chinese building. It had a facadectomy and was stuccoed um, at some time. But <laughs> you can see in the historic photo, it had the balcony out the front. And so based on those historic photographs and with our facade easement program, we were able to recreate what it was originally, and that's where Keon Young will be on May 13th at Mr. Wu's. The other thing is the archival side. Um, we were, have been able to uh, acquire and have donated uh, a variety of different ephemera. Here we have a, a business letter from Fi Li Wong that uh, was a transcription project, and we sent it out, and this is a, a, basically an order form. And it's very hard to see the red lettering, but basically he is ordering a variety of different herbs and fruits, including you know, long vein fruit, which is known as dragon's eye. And based on that, we we're able to go back to the archaeological record and do some flotation of some of these soils that uh, were collected during those archaeological investigations. We partnered with the Black Hill State University Herbarium and we're able to identify some of the diets that were uh, from the, uh, that area of Chinatown, including a peach seed, apricot seed, beans, um, this is peanut shell, not peach seed, um, dragon eye and watermelon seeds and a variety of others. The other thing we've done is walk the hillsides above Chinatown and identify non-native plants, working with them. And so we have those dried in part of our collection as well that uh, talks about the gardens above Chinatown. Um, archaeologically, we've been fortunate uh, uh, with our, our finds. Uh, we have Asian coins, uh, some of those di dating back to the Ming di Dynasty, is that correct, Mike? Um, that are about a thousand years old and were used as part of their religious uh, ceremonies. Obviously, opium pipe uh, bowls, a variety of Chinese ceramics. Um, most recently, I think Trevor was volunteering, one of our commissioners was down in the basement, and Mike always calls and goes, you got five minutes, Kevin, come downstairs here. <laughs> and about an hour later, I get to come back upstairs, but uh, um, he was, they were so excited, and, and it's very cool. We found a domino uh, as part of the collection. Uh, and, and we're able to uh, do additional research on that. And then the chop marks on some of the opium uh, bowls is remarkable. Mike and the volunteers, interns, uh, have been cataloging and putting all this into past perfect. And so we can slice and dice that. We know which box it's in, which bags it in, which feature it's come out of. And I can't uh, say enough about Mike and his work ethic. Um, obviously, uh, and I think it was at lunch, somebody asked me, or, or one of the breaks, how about the Chinese tunnels? Um, we have several uh, under, underground uh, um, sidewalk basements that uh, were promoted as Chinese tunnels. Archaeologically, we've never found any. I don't think there's any, any that have um, existed. But even Dr. Wolf and I are talking, well, maybe that's where they had some of their opium dens. I don't know. <laughs> um, but we did find uh, quite a bit of smoking paraphernalia and, and opium-related uh, uh, products. Um, some of them even had tax stamps. And in fact, uh, you know, we taxed opium at, at the time. We also uh, have a variety of ceramics here. We have a, a whiskey bottle or a, a stoneware liquor bottle, um, close up of the Chinese coins, some Chinese ceramics, and some beautiful uh, Four Seasons. Um, those volunteers, staff, and, and interns get to put pieces of puzzles together. Uh, and you can see uh, what, sometimes when it comes out of the ground, if it's a complete piece, we can put it back together. 
We also have interpretive panels. We have interpreted Deadwood's Chinatown um, with an interpretive panel. We have over 100 of these throughout the community, and uh, we are actually looking at adding some additional ones down in this area. The Century Awards, again, we've recognized High Key and the Wing Shui Building. Um, this was a fun project. Uh, we had some wonderful photographs of uh, the funeral, funerary um, practices of the Chinese. And w the one on the bottom, your bottom right, is the Chinese burner that was part of Mount Moriah Cemetery. Uh, we had two photographs of that. We did archaeological investigation and found the foundation for that. And then based on these uh, historic photographs, yeah, the stucco around it had deteriorated before the building was lost to a point when it was photographed. We could count the bricks, figure out the size, and using that information, create architectural plans and rebuild that um, Chinese burner. Well, well, the fun part about this is one is the bricks are from the Wing Shui building that uh, some volunteers went out and took out of the uh, rubble site and used to rebuild this. And second, the Feely and Wong's relatives were here for the dedication. Beatrice and Edith Wong and other members of the Wong family are here. They're still um, friends of Deadwood. They come out and do a reunion. And uh, I know that Edith uh, played a big role in influencing Robin's fourth book on uh, uh, But Nana series. Um, <clears throat> so we did rededicate it. Um, the, another project was uh, our Mount Moriah Cemetery was started in 1878. Of course, uh, we were founded in 1876, so there was another cemetery before that was opened. It was an Ingleside or Old Deadwood Cemetery. That was on fairly flat land, and so some of those uh, graves were moved up to Mount Moriah. But with our retaining wall uh, program, uh, we found two additional burials that were not moved from the original cemetery. One of them was a CBS special called The Deadwood Pioneer. The first one uh, came back after some um, testing that it was mongoloid, meaning it was either Native American or uh, Asian descent. And so we really didn't know and did not want to do any further investigation on that. So we stopped and re-entered that uh, early pioneer uh, right below um, Seth Bullock's grave above Mount Moriah. And in respect of that person, we had a uh, Taos a Chinese uh, minister, uh, holy man, uh, Lakota holy man, and our Catholic priests giving Chinese rights, Lakota rights, and Christian rights as we re-interned that individual. I can tell uh, other stories, but I probably won't. You can ask me afterwards about uh, some of the things that happened in that <laughs> ceremony. Uh, <laughs> Um, Deadwood history uh, each year uh, continues to celebrate the Chinese and Chinese New Year in Deadwood. And here uh, this year is the year of the rabbit. Uh, we try to engage the uh, youth in our community to understand the importance of the Chinese culture and the role they played in our community. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Robin to talk a little bit about her conversations with the Wong family and uh, her most recent project. Thank you. Uh, my fourth children's book, part of the But Nana series, and that came from the um, high-pitched sounds my grandson used to make. But Nana, because I'm, I'm a Nana and I come from a long line of Nanas, so that's where that came from. But uh, And the series is aptly called But Nana, and then fill in the blank. So the first one is, but Nana, who was Wild Bill? The second one was, but Nana, who was Seth Bullock? The third one is, but Nana, where was Friendship Tower? And then uh, as we were approached by Edith and her family, uh, we created the, but Nana, where was Deadwood's Chinatown? So we, um, we try to get history into very young children's minds. Uh, Betty Jo Huff, my co-author and I, both worked at the Child Care Center in Deadwood. Um, when I came to town from Boston, I was the director of education and support at the center on a one-year grant, and Betty Jo Huff uh, taught preschool and still does. And we wanted to bring an understanding of the history of Deadwood to young children because we would take them out for walks, 
and they would see these words and you know, Hickox is there, and the Bullock is there, and you hear all these names. And so we were trying to figure out how we could bring it to them on a level where they'd understand. So we wrote these books with preschoolers in mind, but then when um, we presented at the Festival of Books, South Dakota Humanities Council and the United Way sent us on the road, so to speak, mm -hmm. and we went to different locations and schools, and libraries, and we found out that grown-ups were interested in the books because of the history that they didn't know. For example, uh, Calamity Jane and uh, James Butler Hickok were not married. In case you didn't know, they were not married. Um, he did marry a woman named Agnes, and she became a businesswoman in the 1850s. Talk about women in situations. Um, pretty much by default because her first husband, whose name was Bill, um, was murdered. And uh, she ran off to join the circus with Bill, and they were together for many years, and then he was killed, and then they had to make a decision. Close the circus or carry on? And they had a meeting with the family. They called the circus uh, that they, everyone they worked with, a uh, family, and the family united absolutely unanimously decided to stick with her. And so they did, and the circus carried on. Um, so our, our main character in the books, all four of them, is a, a precocious preschooler named Jeremiah. His mom is a retired country school teacher. Uh, we have some subtext going on. His mom is deployed in the army. Uh, his dad ends up eventually looking to buy a home, and Jeremiah gets to go to Deadwood to spend time with his nana. And so that's how we go on all these adventures. So we, we learn about the archaeological digs in Deadwood. We talk about that with the children in the books. Um, and we get to see the many finds, and as Kevin said, we had uh, brought some with us that were out in the case. Um, Mike actually let me glue a plate together. <laughs> That was so much fun. Uh, Nana also takes Jeremiah up to Mount Moriah the first year. So the first three books basically take um, place over the summer, the first year that we meet them. And then the uh, Deadwood's Chinatown book is the following year. So he's a little older, and he's writing a little bit more, and he's interested in more of the fun facts that they find out. <clears throat> excuse me. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Nana introduces him to the Chinese and Jewish sections of the cemetery. Nana educates him on the Chinese characters and the Hebrew lettering so that he finds out the different ways they go and the different words that they're called. And uh, he's always hungry, just like my grandson. Always hungry. So Edith, um, who brought uh, gifts when she traveled to meet them in Deadwood in the book, um, as well as to us, uh, she was a, considered our contributing author, but she also brought Betty Jo and I gifts, which was very nice of her. Um, she, she shares treats that she prepared for them. She brings Nana a teapot, a tea set, a teapot and teacups, and in the book, through the archaeological um, items, Jeremiah sees a teapot that's been pieced together down in one of the cases in Mike's laboratory, as we call it. And then he makes that connection of seeing it at in the archives and then on, the, on Nana's kitchen table. And as educators of young children, we want them to make those connections as much as humanly possible, as often as, can, as they can. So um, I, I would just like to thank Bonnie for all her help and support. Uh, in this in endeavor. And uh, I have to show you, Mike allowed us to use his image in the book. <laughs> and so there's Mike, and he's even, he's even got the hat with the Deadwood uh, Historic Preservation logo on it. And that's thanks to our, our fabulous illustrator, Alex Portal. He's done all four <clears throat> of our books. So uh, at this time, Kevin and I would be happy to answer any questions. And thank you so very much for listening.